My pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Peter Sorger from Harvard Medical School. Uh, Peter is the uh, Otto Crayer Professor of Systems Pharmacology at Harvard Medical School, and prior to moving to Harvard, he served as a professor of biology and biological engineering at MIT. Uh, he was the co-founder of Merrimack Pharmaceuticals and Glencoe Software, and is an advisor to multiple public and private companies and research institutes in the US, Europe, and Japan. As the founding head of the Harvard Program in Therapeutic Science and its Laboratory Systems Pharmacology, Peter leads a multi-institutional effort to advance the basic and translational science used to develop new medicines, create novel drug combinations, and identify response of patients. Today, he'll be talking to us about measuring and modeling variability in drug response in cells, tissues, and clinical trials. Peter. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, probably like many people in the room who, who uh, come from the East Coast, I've passed this building many times and wondered what was inside, so now I get a chance to see. Uh, so I'm going to tell you uh, today uh, a story in three parts. So first, I want to I give you the general motivation for the type of work we're doing, uh, and I'll do that fairly briefly, and then I'll show you uh, two applications of imaging to try to get at that, one of which is an ex vivo recapitulation of some of these phenomena, and the other one uh, is a new project in the lab to actually do deep um, uh, spatial and spectral imaging of patient-derived samples. Um, so the primary way in which we treat cancers today is with, uh, is with combination therapy. I think most people are aware of that. Uh, in many cases, with the modern era of targeted therapy, that's a couple of drugs, sometimes on top of standard of care. In the classic curative therapies, for example, used in blood cancers, six or eight or more drugs can be used either simultaneously in sequence. And uh, the question is, really, what, what is the underlying rationale for, uh, for that combination therapy approach? And it's really developed almost entirely alongside an analogy with, with genetics. Uh, or in the cell non-autonomous age where we're looking at um, immuno-oncology drugs, we're thinking about the way uh, cells express uh, different sets of receptors. So just on the left, uh, here would be, I think we stole this from Nature Medicine, uh, some examples of ways in which you would use combination drugs. You either have converging pathways and want to intensify effort, or you have parallel pathways and you want to knock out um, uh, bypass mechanisms, or in the case of of, for example, you know, immuno-oncology drugs and checkpoint inhibitors, the idea is those are expressed on different cell types uh, and you want to antagonize them. And, uh, you know, the underlying uh, notion here, which again now plays out primarily preclinically, and I think this is familiar to most people, is this idea of drug synergy and the drug synergy idea and the ones of pathways are now equated. And we have two definitions. Uh, there's a very nice uh, recent paper, actually, that's come along to show that these are really just two special cases of a more general definition of the way in which drugs would interact, either in terms of dose or in terms of what we call the efficacy, which is the maximum achievable effect uh, at the highest dose. Uh, and so we continue, uh, like I think many people working in the area of modeling cancer biology, to study this uh, preclinically. Um, but in the last couple of years, we became interested in going back to the clinical record insofar as it's available um, and actually asking. Uh, what actually was the underlying basis here? Could we find evidence of these kind of synergistic interactions? Um, and here's sort of a typical example of a combination clinical trial, two individual agents here in yellow or in orange, and then their combination giving an improved uh, outcome. And the way this is often plotted, and many of you will see this, a kind of Kaplan-Meier curve, where there's months uh, or years on the horizontal axis, and then this so-called progression-free survival index, which is not the same as overall survival, but is the time before a patient begins to progress on that, and then often would be sequenced uh, in modern practice onto a salvage therapy. So it turned out that actually this um, had the single biggest challenge in this, for which our, our past in image processing turned out to be unanticipably uh, important, was no data on clinical trials is available in any digital form that you might want. Uh, and in fact, for those of you who uh, have seen the New England Journal has uh, weighed in on this and called what we do here today data parasitology, and uh, I tried to uh, sort of rally, not us specifically, but I think probably half the people in this room would be parasites by their definition. So what we did is we went back, and we took 400 digital uh, records, it's actually one of the great things of moving somewhere like Harvard. It has a lot of really dusty old books in the basement, and so we pulled a couple of those out, um, and we digitized them, and we're trying to get both uh, progression-free survival on individual arms, um, and we're also trying to get what's called censoring events, which is where patients withdraw from the trial, and I can tell you more about that later. Uh, and then it turns out that actually 
uh, these are almost perfectly matched by viable distributions. So uh, they're very long-tailed distributions, which has uh, interesting properties, as you'll see. So here's now a very famous trial of two immuno-oncology drugs, one targeting PD-1, one targeting um, CTLA-4, and you see the individual arms, and I sort of imagine patients benefiting to greater or lesser degree over on the right-hand side. Uh, the combination uh, was exciting when it came out because it appeared to increase survival out to over a year for previously very difficult to treat cancers. Uh, and the notion on that was that both patients are benefiting, or some patients are benefiting from both drugs. Uh, and so we tested an alternative hypothesis, and that is what happens is that in trials like this, there are simply multiple non-discernible populations, and you are addressing the populations in such a way that each patient just benefits from one drug or the other, and there's no interaction between them. Um, and this is called the, the mechanism of independent action, uh, and you can see that prediction shown uh, up, up top there in gray. And that, in fact, seems to predict, and I'll show you this in a moment, over two-thirds or more of all clinical trials and every single multi-arm clinical trial currently involving immunotherapy. So uh, we were sort of excited by this discovery, and then we realized that this was the idea that Sir James Gaddam put forward in 1943 to explain combination cancer therapy. Uh, so in fact, we're now actually going back into the 20s, and there's all sorts of other interesting things back there. And in general, pharmacology, this entire discipline, had much more sort of thinking about mechanism in an era where data was not available and relatively less than we have today. Um, so these are now the ideas that Emil Fry and John Gaddam had, uh, that namely the reason for uh, doing combination therapy is intratumor heterogeneity, which seems very contemporary. The previous talk addressed that. And then what I've told you today, patient-to-patient -patient variability. And in fact, the independent mechanism should be seen as the null hypothesis against which drug interaction is tested. It's exactly like the Bliss and Leuve hypothesis for looking at that in preclinical studies. Now, is there any way you can access this idea? And the most promising approach is actually to use large-scale PDX samples, because then you get a couple of looks at each tumor. And this has come from an amazing data set that was released by Novartis, and we've been collaborating them, although not in the initial release. And you take a bunch of patients, you can take any single tumor, put it out into over 100 mice here, and then treat them individually. And then you can go both forward um, prediction, but you can also do post-diction. You can go backwards and see how this would work. And let me just give you an example. So the patients go, uh, tumors are put in, they're then put on different therapies. Um, and here's a sort of typical example of uh, an experimental FGF inhibitor and a P PI3 kinase inhibitor, two individual arms, uh, and the combination, um, you can now get individual mice is how this is, so you have them sort of in order here. Um, and what you can quickly see is that there are mice that respond very poorly to the green drug who respond well to the pink. And you can, in fact, calculate the correlation. We now know that for human clinical therapeutics around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, relatively uncorrelated. So you simply benefit from having two drugs where you have some chance of being out on the right. You're either pink or green. How well do those work together? And the answer is they combine precisely by independence to giving a statistically a significant improvement. Um, and this hazard ratio would be more than enough to take this, this is mice, of course, but to take this forward into human approval. And we've now gone through, uh, as I mentioned to you, um, almost all cases in which we look where the two agents are active. So if one agent is not active, then, then you have to have a separate mechanism of independence, of course. Um, but m when they are active, um, almost every case, this is an, a sufficient explanation. Um, and there's some cases that are really surprising, and I, I want to shift over to thinking about this a little bit. Um, and here's one, for example, where, uh, where MEK and RAF inhibitors are combined. They actually combine ad advantageously with each other. That's the current standard of care. They're successive parts of a single mechanism. It's MAP kinase pathway, and yet they don't show interaction clinically. Um, the particular example I'm showing you here is a, a case that, uh, I want to move right along. Here's, a, here's the case that, that actually has these combination drugs, and you think about them as working individually. So some of these we've now pulled back uh, sort of preclinically um, and began to ask what's actually happening just in you know, a simple tissue culture setting. You know, to what extent can we see synergy in that setting that doesn't then recapitulate in the clinical setting? So here the, uh, the experiment uh, was really pioneered by Neil Rosen and his colleagues. It's that you take uh, a culture of cells. These are now BRAF uh, 
mutant melanomas, and you can do this in many similar cell lines. You add drug, the goal is to turn off MAPK signaling. Not surprisingly, those cells come right out of cycle and they die. Um, but what uh, had been observed by Neil is there's this little bit of rebound at the end. Um, and if you actually trace that through, and these are some data of our own, what you actually see is you start with a heterogeneous population of cells. These are clonal cells, um, and we can prove clonality in this by a tracing experiment. Um, you add a, ma a RAF inhibitor here, vemurafenib, you kill some subset, probably 90% in the experiment I'm showing you here, and you get this bunch of survivors. Interestingly, these survivors can be cultured ex vivo for months at, uh, until they eventually become, frankly, resistant. But prior to that time, if you then withdraw a drug uh, and you go away on holiday, uh, come out and visit Seattle, then, and you come back to the beginning, you'll actually see you go right back to the beginning again. So these are transiently heritable adapted cell states. And the thinking in the field, as yet unproven, this is part of the uh, origin of residual disease and the thing from which genetic mutants will eventually arise. Um, so, so these, um, and, and by the way, in the adapted cells, uh, that's the place where we think the drug continues to work. It engages its target and it turns off signaling. When we now look at these cells uh, in detail, and we've done this now with quite a few uh, different drugs and cultures, and what you're looking at is an ERK activity uh, reporter here and just uh, some segmentation, uh, live cell image on the left, segmentation on the right, and down below, uh, ERK activity over time. This is 15 hours from a culture. What we actually see happens to these cells in the presence of drug is that they pulse. Um, and on average, 25% uh, of cells pulse in about one cell division time. The cell division time of adapted cells is about four times slower. And if we go in and do transcript profiling and RNA-seq on these, you can actually show that that pulse is long enough in duration to make cyclin E and the proteins necessary to drive cell division. So what's actually happening in these cells when drug is there, yes, you kill a lot, but then these other cells persist and they occasionally pulse. We've actually built a complete kinetic model of this with sadly more than 38 parameters, and I'll tell you about it later if you're interested. Um, but what we're able to demonstrate both empirically and through a kind of mass action uh, compartmentalized representation is actually what's happening in cells is there are two, two pathways that coexist. There's the oncogenic pathway, which is the one we want to inhibit, makes chronic ERK. Because ERK is active, it turns off all the homeostatic neg uh, regulators on MAPK signaling. So the consequence of treating these cells with the oncogene inducer is you've now turned off homeostasis and you've potentiated this physiological cascade. And the pulses that were happening, I didn't show you this, but other experiments show they arise from factors in the microenvironment. And there are a whole series of growth factors that can lead to this little pulse. On it goes, cells divide, and then they go into sort of, sort of G0 for a couple of days and then they divide again. Um, and the interesting thing is exactly what works with respect to oncology is what causes the problem, the Achilles heel, with respect to drug resistance. So there's quite a bit of interest in the field now, this, without this necessarily having been appreciated, in trying to make more potent drugs, and what's noticed is they're not tolerated. So a remarkable thing about RAFMAC therapy is how well it's tolerated, and we suspect the tolerance, this is a purely speculation at the moment, is the Achilles heel, is that normal skin, normal tissue can still pulse away from RTKs even as you turn off the oncogenic signal. So it leads sort of the interesting idea that the, the sort of Achilles heel of this is exactly the reason why it's a tolerated therapy. But coming back to sort of the place we were looking at, we can now go through and do dose response curves, and you see a couple of them here. Um, you can see that that physiological cascade, uh, which is in the color, is highly um, resistant to the therapeutic drugs, even under the concentrations. And the gray here roughly indicates the clinically accessible range. But now if you go through and do a simple isobologram analysis under the assumptions of Leuve, so drug independence, you see these drugs aren't synergistic at all. In fact, they're moderately additive on the oncogenic pathway, and they act with complete independence um, on this uh, resistance mechanism. And in fact, the MEK inhibitor category, and I can tell you why later, is almost completely ineffective. So one sort of little tidbit that's come out of this study, um, and there's, there's obviously more to it, is in fact, even the preclinical description of this in terms of drug synergy is actually not all that good and was done very, very simply. And at the type of sort of single cell level we're interested here, there's actually a lot more fairly complex 
pharmacology and physiology to be understood. And we're now going back and re-dissecting this. And we think that, that actually synergy is not probably a great rationale. By the way, there's an entire NCI program de devoted to this. It's not probably a great preclinical rationale either. So let me just close with coming back to the clinical situation. So why in the world do we not see, though, more I drug interaction additive or synergistic in these populations? We don't know, but the most likely explanation is simply that the patient populations are sufficiently diverse um, that we have within it responders and non-responders to each of the single agents. And it's interesting when you biomarker stratify trials, say for BRAF, the exact drugs we were looking at, the mean, mean value or the median value of the distribution of response shifts to the right. It wouldn't be a good biomarker if it wasn't, but the variance in the response does not go down. So they remain highly long-tailed. So what we're now trying to do is go on to clinical trials, either uh, the, the definitive trial, if we can get the access to the data, or ongoing um, uh, patient and uh, physician-initiated trials. And let me just show you one quick example where we have patients on MAPK therapy and we can then get biopsies from them um, while they're on therapy or after progression. And the type of samples that we could get, surgical resection, core and needle biopsy, blood sample, et cetera, the question is, can we do anything with this sort of material? Um, and what's traditionally been done, as most of you know, the entire field of pathology uh, is to do H&E imaging. Of note, if you do go into a cancer clinic, you will rapidly discover that 6% of patients are diagnosed based on a genetic mutation, and 100% of patients are diagnosed based on um, pathology. Um, and in the last year or so, we've worked on a couple of methods. Um, there's actually a big field of this, and the methods we have, we've um, put entirely in the public domain, where we can now take whole resection specimens, and we can look at high resolution in about 60 channels. And we can go back to archival specimens. And so now the question is, can we get enough mechanistic information out of high resolution imaging without the temporal component, but we do have a time sequence in many cases, uh, to begin to dissect out response uh, variables. Uh, and, I, and I can't tell you that we're so successful, but I want to just show you a little bit where we are and then wrap up. Uh, here's an example. We're going into the skin, looking at early melanomas. Um, you know, you can go up and enumerate all of the cell types and their spatial distribution. You can look at areas of the skin where disease is regressing through natural immunological reaction and places which are not. Uh, here's a single patient from the cohort I showed you before. This is now a TISNY plot, not so a high-dimensional projection. Um, I think TISNY is vaguely disreputable, but in this case, um, in these applications, you can see the clearly, the, you can see the pre-treatment, the on-treatment, and the post. Drug has turned the cells off, as you would expect, and we can already, within two weeks, see the emergence of these drug resistance markers, which exactly mimic what I was showing you in the pulsing state preclinically. So I think the, the last two slides, then, where we're headed now is to begin to, instead of trying to take a, a genetic uh, predictor ahead of time, actually do an on-therapy biopsy and then assay it by imaging. And one promising uh, device here uh, from the work of Jonas et al is to actually come in with these micro devices that release, they're about uh, three millimeters long, uh, they, they release drugs uh, up to 20 different molecules locally, and then you can actually assay um, whether, in fact, there's been an adequate patient response. And what we would predict from the independence mechanism I showed you before is that, in fact, patients will respond very differentially to individual arms of conventional chemotherapy. So just to leave you with two final images, this is actually a, um, the Topaccio trial was uh, one of the large ovarian cancer trials. We went into the freezer. Once you've met pathologists, you'll find they have blocks, just like entire rooms of this stuff. So we pulled a couple of blocks from exceptional responders. And this is now uh, a sort of image that you can get of a five-year-old specimen. We did this in 30 channels. Uh, you can see the sort of cells. And then I have a slightly ridiculous animation here. Um, uh, so this would not be impressive if we were, uh, if we were looking at uh, preclinical kind of materials, but it's sort of impressive that you can pull this out of somebody's back room um, in, in a cancer clinic. What you're looking at actually are the tumor cells in red. They've just faded away, and we're particularly focusing now on PD-1, PD-L1. So that's the ligand receptor pair that are the primary target of modern immuno-oncology. And the question arises is when are these in apposition to each other so they could actually signal. And the answer is only, maybe no surprise to us, this is juxtacrine signaling. It's not the abundance of these molecules that seems to matter. It's when they can actually come into physical touch. And these are the kind of things that can be directly assayed. So let me just leave it there. 
um, uh, to give you the sense that I think we're moving to a different way of thinking about precision cancer therapy where we actually can use on-treatment biopsy and on-treatment imaging of this type to actually determine not only basic science questions like who uh, interacts with whom, this would be marital training data for what we saw previously, but also uh, the way to sequence patients through. So just to conclude, uh, you know, I think many combination therapies, we think of them as synergy. There's no, almost no evidence to show that, um, particularly in immuno-oncology drugs. This kind of independence provides a test, and we actually see quite a few new combinations that are worse than independence. So you're actually killing patients because you want to use fancy drugs. Um, the, and we think that's a consequence of heterogeneity. Reports of preclinical -syn synergy are probably misleading as well, and I think there's some pretty cool biology underneath that. Um, and then there's at least the possibility that you can um, translate these biomarkers um, back into the clinic and begin to test some of the underlying assumptions of that initial model. So thank you very much. <laughs> We have time for one question before break, uh, right here in the middle. Michael, microphone's coming to you. Uh, here you're treating a uh, cancerous cell with, with drugs. Um, and if you define cancer as an organization anomaly, and that cancer cells are departing from the overall organization of the system as a whole, what accounts have you done, have any studies been done on the cause of the cancer cells departing from the organization of the human organism as a whole? And what forces are involved with that? Yeah, no, it's a great question, actually. Um, the, so. Th one tends to see, we know that in terms of a sort of genetic landscape, you know, these are mutations. The area where we and others are looking at this are now in precancers. So these technologies can be taken. We're looking at precancers um, of the skin. So, you know, by the time you get into your 50s, you have several hundred oncogenic mutations in your skin but you, on each square centimeter. But you don't develop cancer because the local immune system, skin has resident T cells. In fact, good fraction of our immune system lives in our skin and our gut, of course. Those immune cells can come in, f identify the cancer cells, and actually then, through natural immune surveillance, eliminate them. So the question is, you know, what actually happens in those early steps that leads to a disorganization of the tissue and the inability of the immune system to do that editing? Um, so in the skin, clues are just coming out now. That would be on top of what we think of as the genetic evolution. Um, the other way to think about it is that in many resection specimens, colon, for example, you often get adjacent normal tissue, and you actually can see the initial process of transformation in that resection. So you can see from the highly organized tissue that you would hope to see to these, uh, the, these cancerous tissues. And that has been described in the pathology literature for over 120 years without the molecular type features we can add to it. So it doesn't fully address your question, but I think we're going to be able to overlay on our sense of the genetic production of cancer now this much more sophisticated morphological cellular type description that ultimately will hopefully include the kind of things you heard from Julie Thiriot and others. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.